for multilateral facilities, then the speed, the pace of change, and the pace at which solutions are enacted are geological, glacial. And when it comes to biodiversity, it may all be gone by the time some consensus, some real consensus is reached. There's a third level of hurdles, and these are called science deniers. And Tanya alluded to this in her presentations. And these people, as this art piece shows, the damned being cast into hell. The science deniers are, in my opinion, I can't be polite about this. They are the damned and they ought to be tossed into hell. Because they reject any and all science they don't like and accept the science they do like. So they don't judge the science on its merits. They judge the science on whether they like it or not and whether it serves their special interests or not. So creationists don't like the results of research on evolution. They don't like the research that the, the Earth is you know, 4.5 billion years old, not 6,000 years old. Many industries don't like the research that shows that climate change is occurring and has occurred for the last 100 years at an unprecedented rate. So they will deny the science because they don't like it, not because it isn't good. And the strategy they use to deny the science is called the wedge of doubt. Create a doubt about the veracity of the science. All you need is one doubt to wedge open the door. Use any means to question the data, question the models, question the analysis, question the results. That's why all of us in science have to be extremely scrupulously careful when we publish results, when we give press conferences, and what we claim. Because what we claim better be backed up by hard science that is undeniable and unrefutable. We are not allowed to make mistakes. We don't have that luxury because the people who will deny the science will jump on that mistake and say, ha ha, they were wrong about that glacier. Therefore, the entire science is wrong. You cast a wedge of doubt, then you take out the baby and you toss it out with the bathwater. The example is one of the more recent ones are they saw some IPCC researcher emails from one to the other. Or there was some private communication where some emotions were expressed and opinions were expressed. And they jumped on that. Here's a nice bird that just flew in. Oh. Um, and they jumped on that to say, see, these guys are cooking the data ahead of the time. Or the example that Tanya gave about the glacier. They were wrong about that glacier. And immediately the science deniers jumped on it and said, they're wrong about the glacier, therefore all of their conclusions are wrong and all of the models are wrong and all of the data is being way overinterpreted. We can't afford to make those mistakes. So for example, Town showed a slide of a claim by one of the NGOs that 30% of biodiversity will be gone by the year 2050. Really? We like to read those headlines. It's certainly NGOs like to make those headlines. Why? Because if the situation isn't bad, they won't get any funding. Face it, NGOs like World Wildlife, uh, Conservation International, TNC, and many others, they do great work. However, their funding depends on bad news. So, can we back that statement up? 30% of biodiversity will be gone by 2050. Really? Can we actually demonstrate that? 
If you're called into a courtroom and you have to demonstrate that, you, we couldn't do that. It's one of these hand-waving claims. That sounds good for PR, but cannot stand the test of science. And that's the kinds of stuff we should avoid because the science deniers will jump on that. One mistake kill, can kill the entire operation. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Discussion? The problem is, is that we all make mistakes. And, uh, and the, uh, we can easily end up with the, uh, you come up and bring your microphone next to me. <laughs> you, um, you, um, you can easily start to suffer from the paralysis of analysis because you're just scared to make mistakes. Correct. So That's why we have error bars. So I think the IPCC has been really smart when it uh, publishes their results about climate change and the effects of climate change and their different efforts. There's always a plus or minus value. And, and I think that's how you take care of a lot of the uncertainty. They say, yes, we are not 100% certain. There isn't any science result that is 100% certain. But it's certain within, uh, you know, plus or minus 5%, plus or minus 10%. Yeah, because I, I mean, one of the things that I always find problematic about the conservation sector in general was the message of doom and gloom. Yes. Because at, the, at some point in time, you know, people just become so tired of that message. Right. And it, it just doesn't re resonate any longer. And I think that was very much a strategy of the environmentalists of the 80s, you know, where yeah. everything was falling apart. And I, I mean, the one big lesson that we've learned in Sandby is that going with the message of doom and gloom, it's not getting you anywhere. No, you know, I agree with that you. That is just counterproductive. Excellent. But the actual point I'd like to ask, or just ask you, do we have a broader framework or guidelines or some kind of approach that will help researchers to understand what is required if you'd like to make that science policy leap? You know, because very often I think the researchers can't make that leap because they don't understand what it means. Correct. Um, and one of the things that we've been thinking about is, would there be some kind of criteria that if we want to do research that's got an influence on policy, it, it needs to conform or needs to at least address, address these set of issues, a framework or something that's already out there that one could draw on? I think that's an excellent point. Um, and I think uh, some of the blame, perhaps a great deal of the blame, is that our educational system now just funnels people into their very strict disciplinary tracks. They have to learn so much, say, of biology, evolutionary biology, statistics, and now some computation, that uh, there is no time to learn the realpolitik of the world, the political science, the, the, the legal issues, the, even a, a bare minimum of the economic issues. Uh, I, I, would, I would venture that, for example, uh, most folks who uh, would say, yeah, we should, for example, with um, uh, multilateral uh, uh, facilities, that the GNP should be the basis for the country contributions. I would imagine most researchers don't know what the GNP is based on, that it completely avoids the environment, and that if most economists agree it's a terrible measure of the economic health of countries or their potential, and yet all countries still do it, and it is the basis for all payments to the UN, to, to GBIF, to uh, the CBD, and so forth. Uh, we're not taught these things, and we should. Uh, I think one of the answers there would be a broader uh, what used to be called a liberal arts education. Not only in your own specialty, but set your education in a world context. Uh, I wish we could do more of that. Yes? Uh, what is, I didn't understand the well, what is the U.S. police uh, at the international level? Uh, the question is, what is the U.S. policy at the international level? 
boy, I wish I knew. <laughs> I don't know. I can't speak for U.S. international policy. They have many different policies at the international level. Uh, as you know, they, um, the U.S. is not a signatory to the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, although it observes many of the terms of the convention. Uh, it sends delegations to convention meetings. Um, uh, G uh, the U.S. is a signatory to IPES, so therefore is bought into that. The U.S. is the major funder of the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, so it, and has been for the last uh, 12 years, 13 years, so it buys into that. Um, I think the U.S. policy in general internationally is a very good one. Um, it, uh, I think it tries to weigh uh, science against uh, its own interests, its own economic interests, its own political interests, and it has to weigh um, the science and biodiversity policy against many, many, many other political interests uh, in the country. It's kind of like saying, what is, the US ad what is the U.S. policy towards human rights in the world? Well, in general, its policy towards human rights is excellent. It demands human rights in all countries. However, that doesn't mean it still won't be trading with countries that have awful human rights, because these are the political realities. Sure. Thanks. Um, I have uh, some interest about your presentation of yesterday. I have still a question to okay. ask you. Okay. Uh, it's a matter, let's say, succeeding in building, let's say, a biodiversity informatics um, institute is a question of time. And you talk about good collaboration, investment in good ideas, good collaborators to stay together, okay, to achieve, let's say, the objectives. You know, one of uh, the key uh, factors of that success is that uh, you are in, at your position for a long time. In uh, my home country, like also uh, many countries in uh, Africa or even outside uh, overseas, um, a director of an institute usually have, uh, has to stay for a short period of time, no matter how efficient he is. For instance, at my university, you have a mandate for three years, and if you are successful, or if, uh, let's say, you don't have politicians against you, you have a second mandate, that is six years. And, uh, of course, if you are a good manager of human resources, uh, a very good actor, you have to go anyway. So, if you leave, what, what is the future, what can be the future of, of all you have, uh, let's say, uh, undertaken after you leave? It is also a, a, an important issue to, to raise for that. Uh, this is a terrific question. Just uh, let me summarize it. Uh, is, and it refers back to my presentation from yesterday on building uh, biodiversity informatics institutions. Um, in many countries, including in Benin, in, in Jean Ganglo's country, uh, uh, directors have a term appointment of, say, three years, perhaps renewable for another three years. So how do you handle uh, making long-term uh, partnerships, network building that are successful, how can you ensure their sustainability and their continuance when the guy or the woman at the top changes every three or six years and may not want to continue those? That's a terrific problem. Um, my answer there is, uh, if, is to try and institute the kind of partnership and the kind of uh, network that is so uh, uh, ingrained now in the organization, that is so built in, that is so integrated, and that becomes so critical, becomes blue chip, 
that if the new director canceled it, he or she would see that the institution would go down. And it would not be in their interest to cancel it. So you have to create, in a very short time, a successful partnership, a successful network that is so good that it becomes blue chip, or certainly high growth, and is seen by the new director as something he or she wants, has to continue for their own survival. Because if it goes away, they will look bad because it went down on their watch, not on your watch. You created it, they do away with it, the institution suffers, they will suffer. They won't get renewed. So that's my best answer for that. And I think our time is up for this one.